إنك لا تهدي من أحببت ولكن الله يهدي من يشاء. Today we have a very special guest, a very good friend of mine, Sheikh Dr. Bilal Phillips. Assalamualaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. My pleasure to see you and to sit with you. Alhamdulillah. It's nice to see you again. Alhamdulillah. My pleasure. So, Sheikh, I have been doing the podcast now for a few months, just interviewing different. Islamic personalities, you know, more on their journey, what they've been doing, what what, how they came to Islam, and also what they how they've been actually benefiting uh, the Muslim community. So, inshallah, today I wanted to uh, speak to you about your your journey, because you've not always been a Muslim. True. You know, a lot of people. I know you've been a Muslim for quite a while, mm-hmm. uh, but subhanallah, many people think maybe you know you were born into Islam. Because you've done so much, alhamdulillah, a lot of work for Islam. Although the name Phillips usually gives it away, you know. Because <laughs> they'll ask, maybe they might assume yeah. that, okay, he's Muslim, but then why has he got this name Phillips? Yeah. You know, uh, where, where's that name come from? Yeah. Or why, even if you became a Muslim, why do you keep the What's name Phillips? Name? You know, why don't you change that name? You know, <laughs> is, you know but yeah, then yeah. I have to enlighten them that... Uh, you know, from an Islamic perspective, it's not mm-hmm. permissible for one to uh, remove one's family name. Mm-hmm. You know, this is actually a requirement. Though everybody is familiar with Yusuf Islam, mm-hmm. you know, and you know other mm-hmm. personalities who have just wiped out their mm-hmm. names, right? So, but you Islamically, actually, it's you uh, actually have something in common with Yusuf Islam, don't you? You, you're yeah, both singers, right? Yeah, musicians. Mus- musicians. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was also a jazz singer before. Uh huh. Alhamdulillah, we left that now. Yeah, inshallah. So, Sheikh, when did you accept Islam? I accepted Islam in 1972. Inshallah. 1972. I was 25 at the time. Um, alhamdulillah, that was um, after traveling through communism, because I had left Christianity, I got involved in um, <clears throat> university politics, I was studying in university at the time, and um, communism in Canada was sort of spreading amongst mm-hmm. the students, university students, etc. Mm-hmm. So I got caught up in that and, and in the student movement. So I saw in communism an answer for the world's problems, you know. After studying some history, you know, when you grew up in in Canada, uh, you're not uh, aware of what's happening in the rest of the world and, you know, the oppression which existed in the past. Mm. You know, in in America, there's more exposure to civil rights movements and these kinds of things, so you can understand. So I grew up in Canada without being really aware of that. Mm. When I went to university, then I started to became, become exposed mm. to that uh, movements and things that took mm. place and injustices, mm. reading the histories of the, the North American Indians, mm. you know, the, the oppression that they went through, mm. the slaughter, stealing of their lands and all this, you know, you could, it now becomes like, wow, it's a big eye-opener, you know. Mm. I remember a, there's a classical book I read in that time called... Um, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee by D. Brown. Mm. I think it's D. Brown, yeah, who wrote it. But this book, you know, lists what happened to the Indians, the, mm. the treaties that they made with the European colonizers mm. and how these treaties were broken, how they were cheated, the lands still So it's like an alternative history to what you've been taught. Yeah, about. yeah. Well, it's really not even alternative. It's just, yeah, I guess it's alternative. Mm. Because, you know, it's the other side. Yeah. We did, you didn't hear from the other side. Yeah. You know, it was always the, the settlers coming with their, you know, their wagons and they would make a circle and the Indians would be coming in off the mountains, yeah. you know, with their spears and arrows. Yeah. And, you know, and these poor settlers are just trying to live a life. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the reality was a whole other story yeah. altogether. We were, we were faced like butter would have melt, you know, like Yeah, You know, the... Uh, I had a similar experience, you know, you know, I think you know already I, when I traveled to Sierra Leone, I was doing business, but at this point, you know, I was like 
from England, you know, the great British Empire, you know, the great things we did for the world. Until you land in Africa, realize the reality of uh, the whole thing. And you start to research and, and, and to study, the, you know, this whole truth, like you said, the, the, the truth of the civil rights in America and all this. Yeah. It opens your mind. Yeah. yeah. So this is what, uh, you know, because communism mm -hmm. then offered an alternative saying, mm -hmm. well, no, people are equal. They should be, you know, equal everywhere mm -hmm. in all facets mm -hmm. of life and you know, so to find that utopian society mm. where people would work according to their ability and only take according to their need. You know, mm. this is the, the agenda of the communists, right? You it, know? it works on paper. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds nice, sounds beautiful, you know, wonderful, yeah. but it just doesn't happen, actually. That, that's agenda, really. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So um, after traveling that route, you know, being engaged at certain points with elements of the the uh, civil rights movement, black power movement in the U.S. and that, you know, and um, coming to the conclusion after a, a journey there that, yeah, communism really wasn't the answer mm -hmm. because it really didn't change what it was supposed to change. Mm -hmm. You know, Russia didn't become an egalitarian mm -hmm. society with all this equality. In fact, Stalin massacred millions, mm. you know, and then, then the, the most modern, I, you know, extension from that was China. Mm. And, uh, and China, you know, Mao Zedong and his red book, this was like the classic, you know, but uh, then you come to find out that in the Cultural Revolution, millions were killed again in the name of protecting the revolution, you know, so... Shay, was you, was you a, a, only a political communist, or did you actually was you atheist as well? No, I've like, become atheist. You're an atheist. I became an yeah. atheist. Yeah. So was that like um, something you'd researched, or you just kind of was you more atheist against religion, or did you not believe in a, a creator at that point? You know, what was your definition of atheist? Well, you know, I was a nominal Christian. Mm. You know, I went to church because my parents' family went to church. We went to church. Yeah. But uh, to say that I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior, yeah. no, it didn't happen. It was something that was said, you heard it, and maybe you repeated it a few times <laughs> or whatever, but you know, it was just not something that went into your brain and you became, you know, yeah. transformed, you know, yeah. the, the Holy Spirit had, yeah. you know, changed your whole life outlook mm. and no no I didn't it was just like school you know mm. we used to go to Bible class and these kind of things but you know that was you, you went there to to check out the chicks you know <laughs> <laughs> plan for the weekend parties and you know, these yeah. kinds of things it wasn't really <laughs> religious you know so to speak so what church did you go to? <laughs> You were Presbyterian. My you know? church wasn't like that. Church, you, know? you had a hardcore. You know? Maybe. No, yeah. I don't think. I think you were I don't Catholic. Think a, I don't think there's anyone old, like under sixteen in my church. Really? Yeah. No, no. Well, I mean, of course, you went to church a long time after me. Yeah. You know, I was yeah. going to church. You know, in 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 the fifties and sixties. What type of church was you going? To? Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I was uh, Church of England. Yeah. So it's a bit church more. Of more, yeah, yeah, closer to the Catholic, yeah, uh, yeah more. Whereas, you know, Presbyterian already, mm. uh, although there are an element from the Anglican, you know, mm. they they do retain something, mm. but, you know, it's Protestants in general mm. uh, were just wide open. It was mm. just uh, a belief, you know, you mm. you say, I believe Jesus Christ is your person, mm. Savior, and then after that, everything is life. <laughs> you know, it's a whole, no, res no, restrictions, requirements, and it's wide open. So that's why, so church, you know, became uh, just a meeting place. You know, people would go, you know, with their fineries on Sunday, you know, show off their latest dresses and the, the guys with their suits and whatever, you know, it was, it was just a, a show. It was not, um, and then of course in America, it turned into something else. There's, you know, became a whole, you know, 
rock, uh, you know, mm-hmm. occasion. It was just a, an event. You know, everybody's up there with the guitars and you know singing, and as a whole, at least the, the one I was in in Canada, they were not in that stage. I mean, the, the black churches in in America and whites that also take that same route. You know, the, there's a whole different uh, thing. So for me, uh, you know, <coughs> I was not, you know, really. Uh, a, a practicing Christian, a nominal mm. Christian. Mm. You know, my father didn't used to go to church. My mother did, mm. so, mm. but my father mm. didn't. He mm. later on told me, uh, after I accepted Islam, that the reason why he never used to go, but he would send us mm. go with your mother, but why he never went was because of the fact that when he was about twelve. Back in Jamaica, mm. or 12 or 13, he studied logic because they used to teach that in a British system of education mm. back. That's no, back mm. in the 30s and stuff, mm. right? You know, 30s. He studied logic. And after studying logic, he said, Jesus could not have been God. No way. It's illogical. Mm. completely illogical mm. so from that point mm. at the age of around 13 he rejected the idea of Jesus' divinity and, <coughs> and he only prayed to God he had become a muahid you know and that was it for mm. his brothers and sisters they used to call him the atheist oh. because for them if you didn't believe that Jesus was God you didn't believe in God. So the fact that you're worshiping God is, is nullified. It has no value. Because mm. that God that you're worshiping is not Jesus. Mm. So you're not worshiping God. You're like an idol worshiper or anybody else. So you're a disbeliever. They call him the atheist. You know? Mm. But his father was one of the leading theologians of the Presbyterians in Jamaica. Well known, you know, pastor. Phillips, well known, you know, so they grew up in the church. So he had the full exposure, you know, at, at, at that age, whatever. So that uh, Christianity was just from my mother's side. Yeah. She was still believing that system of belief. And um, we used to go to church with her. You took some money, you had to put it in the plate, and you were like, should I just stick it in my other pocket? Or, <laughs> you know, like a whatever. Big pocket. <laughs> you can slide it across. You know, your hand makes the movement, whatever. You, you put some in the text. Like yeah. <laughs> so, you know, because we, I know we were always resentful of that. You know, we had to go put our pennies or whatever in the, in the plate. And why? But we did it because that was the tradition. So, so when you got to university, you started looking at, you know, learning about different... Uh, the world. Yeah. For the first time now, the whole world is opened up to you. Mm. You know, your, your thinking, exposure to people, professors with many different ideas and that, you know, and then you became aware. Student movement, I initially went into it, um, you know, just to be in with everybody else, you know, but eventually the ideas start to rub off on you and, you know, and, uh, so it became, yeah. yeah. Communist. So, so, what was your study at that point? Biochemistry. Biochemistry. Mm -hmm. I was almost, I was, you know, one semester away from graduation, Mm -hmm. you know, and then, uh, then I went to the States got caught up in that movement, shut down the university. This was Simon Fraser University in West Coast, Canada. Shut down the university, the students shut it down, went down to the U.S., to San Francisco, you know, California, um, linking up with the active communist, you know, what they had to call the Soledad Defense Committee. I joined up with them. Sounds, Angela. Sounds like he was pretty deep in the movement. Yeah, yeah. I was studying. I was studying. Yeah, no, no. I studied. 
I went and studied, you know, the the books, you know, um, and um, caught up in that movement itself. But at the same time, observing, you know, what was happening around myself, and I I could see a lot of ill discipline, you know, in the members, you know, of, of the movement that which disappointed me and. People had not changed, you know. I was thinking that this would have caused people to be more honest, more just, more fair, more whatever. But the people were just the same people, you know. They just talked a different talk. <laughs> but, you know, life-wise, they were living the same lives. They just found another uh, channel by which to promote themselves or whatever, you know. So this, he was also at this time. He was also a musician. He was, he was a guitarist. Right? Yeah, yeah, singing, singing, and guitar. Yeah, I mean, actually, that was uh, more in Malaysia. Uh, in Malaysia, when my family had moved to Malaysia before I came back to go to university in in uh, Canada. When I first came back, I was still in university. Whilst I'm in university, I was playing in nightclubs and things like this, you know. But once I got into the communist thing, I basically had no time for that anymore. So I, I sort of left it hanging. I, when I went back up to Canada from the States, um, I joined another sort of um, cultural communist uh, movement, youth movement there in Toronto. And um, I started playing with a band again there, playing in nightclubs and that, but mainly using the music as a means to, to bring uh, people to rallies and to gatherings and stuff like that, because they, they would use some of that you know, as, a, as a means of drawing people who would come for the music and then you give them the talk afterwards mm -hmm. kind of thing, right? So. We, see, we see people trying to do this in Dawa these days. So, <laughs> yeah. So, subhanAllah, so at the age of 25, you accepted Islam. How did this come about? Well, you know, um, there were some brothers from the States who had come up. They were draft dodgers, mainly, because this was Vietnam War time. And um, that's what a lot of the universities, uh, you know, uh, demonstrations and shutting down in the Canada was about because Canada was making the bombs which the Americans were dropping on the Vietnamese. Mm. So, you know, students say, what is going on here? What does Canada have to do with this? Mm. And, you know, so <clears throat> uh, at, at that time in, in, in Toronto, um, there were many Americans who had, had come up from the U.S. They were in this university in in um, West Coast Canada, Simon Fraser University also. In Toronto, there were many that came uh, avoiding the draft so they wouldn't be sent over to Vietnam because the borders were open for Americans to come up to, to Canada. So they came up and stayed. So some of them that came up were Muslims. They would converted to Islam in the States. So they gravitated towards, because they were into sort of a political... Yeah. Islam, but it was the political dawa, the, the movement at the time. So they would come to the rallies and they would try to promote their dawa here and there where they could. I mean, I wasn't really open to, to, to the dawa because we were already clear that, you know, religion was the opium of the masses. So mm -hmm. there was not really any thought along those lines. But one of them managed to uh, affect, or they would say infect, you know, one of the, the one of the the uh, women that were part of our, uh, our our central committee, she accepted Islam, and that shocked me, because she was a hardcore communist. She was a Maoist, right? Yeah. You know, it's the hard. She had memorized Mao Zedong's Red Book and the whole shot. In so, Chinese. Eh? In Chinese. Yeah. No, no, not Chinese. <laughs> of course not. That, that, yeah, that, that would have been dedication. something else. <laughs> but uh, she, you know, uh, she had memorized it. So she was really hardcore Maoist. So how in the world could she accept Islam? Religion, you know. So uh, this is what I asked her. I said, well, what's going on, you know? 
so she said, uh, so, so she said that you know actually Islam is not like the other religions. You know that yeah, it's true. You know what we learned about religion and you know used to to placate the the masses so that they would not desire you know the things of this world. They wouldn't challenge the the upper class that is running the society. Because they will all be told it's it's paradise is coming after this world, mm. so you you be happy with what you have here mm. now, you know. So it was understood, but she, she, she said, uh, you know, Islam is not like that. It's a whole different thing. Actually, Islam is very revolutionary, you know. And then the, we watch movies like um, they call it the Battle of Algiers, you know, where the Algerians were the first country in Africa that liberated itself. Not were given their 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 independence, but liberated itself through battle, fought their way until France had to let go, right? So this was like you know this is the this is the revolution, successful revolution. But the battle cry was Allahu Akbar. <laughs> what is this Allahu Akbar? You know, God is great. Ha? Huh, how? What's the connection? You know, and so uh, that. Uh, seeing those uh, issues, and then I started to read Islamic books, in particular the um, uh, book by Muhammad Qutb called Islam, the Misunderstood Religion. This was the book that really did it for me. You know, it was only like the second book I read on Islam, and that was it. That book covered everything because it was a political. Communism. He, yeah, he looks at the, everything. He's looking at communism, capitalism, socialism, you know, Christianity, everything, everything, which was that people followed to show basically what he, the, the, the summary of what he showed there was that all the good that was found in all of these religions and systems and political, all of that good is there in Islam. And each one of these had negative aspects to them. And all of that negativity is not found in Islam. So what other conclusion that you can come to that, hey, Islam has got it all, you know? So it was clear, it was clear. All the good points were there. So I said, well, okay, yeah, this is something I could accept. You know, because I was having, as I told you, I was having my doubts at the time. It was that, that the same period I was also reading more about the history and and seeing the, the impact of communism on these countries, China and Russia and related countries, and uh, you know how much injustice that ended up developing there under the name of communism, and, and how these countries <coughs> couldn't, couldn't compete with the capitalist countries. If communism is so great, it should have shot ahead and been the, the economic power of the world. But instead, you know, the people were still down. They couldn't compete with, with America and Europe. And you know, so. sometimes non-Muslims they, they try to use this argument against Islam. They say, if if Islam is so good as you say, how can the Muslims be in the situation that they are today? But it's because they're not following Islam the way it should be. Yeah, or you can just simply say that <coughs> this is a period in history. Go back to the period when they were yeah. the top of the world. They, technology, everything was them. People came to them to learn. Yeah. So it, it's shown that Islam can take people to the top of the world. Yeah. You know, so it's there. So the fact that it's down right now, you know, they were overcome and whatever. It's, yeah. So it's down. It doesn't mean that it can't be there. Yeah. You know, so so it, which is different. Communism never had a period when they. Yeah. It, it, only now, with China, Russia to a smaller degree, but only now with China, China has now come up to become world power. But it didn't become that under communism. Mm. That's the whole point. Mm. That what they had to modify that communism till it became capitalism with the name communism on the outside. Mm. You know, they became capitalists. Mm. They accepted that capitalism, you know, had value. And it would move the society forward, and we keep the theory of communism in place. But yeah. what is working and moving, you know, the engine of the society is, is capitalism. Mm -hmm. 
It's not communism, not communist economics. Mm. It's capitalist economics. Mm. So, you know, so they, 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 they don't have any proof mm. from that perspective. Um, so, so at this point you, you accepted Islam and then you, you went to study in Medina. Yeah, uh, within a year after I accepted Islam. Yeah, within a year. But, you know, in that one year, I joined Jamaat al tabligh I went to the UK. They had the first ijtima in the West, there in Dewsbury, right? And um, I had spent my four months there in the UK. I completed my four months there in the masjids of the UK because I'd gone there seeking knowledge. This was the idea. In Canada, I accepted Islam. The few books I had, limited, tried to get other books, very few books available. You know, okay, sit, study under people, you know, foreigners who were there in the masjid from different countries, Egyptians, Moroccans, you know, and trying to get knowledge with the realizing that it's very limited. These guys are just, you know, cultural Muslims. So what they gave you is their piece of their culture, <laughs> and they, you know. You, so where was the real Islam in all of this, you know? So then when they said, oh, "Okay, yeah, you want to study? We've got scholars in England. We have over fifty mosques in Canada, in Toronto at the time. There are only two mosques in the whole of in Toronto, whole. whole of Toronto. You know? So at that time, so fifty mosques, and in every mosque there's a Maulana who's studied." That's like, you know, ah, you know, the, 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 the student's dream. So I went there and I sat, I had my notebooks with me. I would sit, ask the questions and the Maulanas would tell me and I'd make the note of all the answers of, you know, I, good four months of study. Came back to Toronto and, um, you know, told my wife, we are Hanafis. You know, because, you know, you had to follow one of the four madhabs according to what everybody was saying. And, of course, most Muslims are Hanafis. Abu Hanifa was the first of the Imams. You know, yeah. <laughs> Go with the majority. You know, so, you know, I became a Hanafi. Told my wife, I had to learn in, 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 um, in the UK, I had to learn the, the female prayer for Hanafis. Because it's so different from the male, it's not something you can even explain it in writing. It has to be demonstrated, mm -hmm. you know? So I learned that female prayer from the Maulanas, and I came back, taught my wife, you know, how to pray according to the Hanafi way. Mm -hmm. And um, then I moved uh, next door. I recommend a good book for this, actually, The Evolution of Faith. Yeah, yeah, it gives the whole history. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, a, a book, uh, the evolution of it, uh, kind of explaining and bringing people through the history of the how it has developed and, uh, to understand the madhabs because the madhab is a mystery in the minds of the majority of Muslims. They know it. They heard the name madhab or you know, yeah. madhab, or we pronounce it different ways, maslak, they have different names, yeah, even, you know, but the madhab, the reality of the madhab, the vast majority of Muslims have no idea. You know, are they different religions? Some even call them different sects. You know, we have the Hanafi sect, we have the Shafi sect, some, no, don't call it sect, it's not really sect, it's madhab. So what is the madhab? It, you just follow one. That's a, you know, this is, they're all correct. So this was the point. We were told that they're all correct. If anyone you follow is okay, you know, though Hanafi is the best one to follow since the majority of people are following it, but any of the others you follow, it's okay. If you don't follow one, then your imam is shaitan. Wow. Yes. Never heard that one yeah. Even they, you had books coming from Turkey. Uh, this Hussein Ishik, he wrote some books. And, and in this book, one of his books, he's explaining about the Madhab. He says, 
One of the questions you will be asked in the grave is, what is your madhab? Yeah. They even went to that point, <laughs> you know. So it made it really serious about this madhab thing. So <laughs> I remember uh, when I, um, <clears throat> so I moved next to the masjid, masjid. Imam of the masjid was a Shafi'i imam from Egypt. And I started studying with him, fiqh sunnah mm. you know, I, with the evidences and that. And I started to see the contradictions, you know. And I saw that ultimate contradiction where the, Shafi'i say, if you accidentally touch a woman, mm. your wudu is not broken. Your wudu is broken. Mm. And, but if Hanafi said, if you touch a woman, your wudu is not broken. So, you know, that is the irre irre irreconcilable difference. Mm. You know. If you studied the logic that your father has studied. No you way. Can't, can't accept it. Has one has to be correct. One has to be incorrect. Mm. So this is what set me and made me ready for Medina. Mm. And when I reached that point of understanding, and the person who gave me shahada, just mm. as a point of information, was a, uh, Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick. Hakim Quick. He was one of the Americans who had come up. Was uh, he's the one who converted that sister? Subhanallah. Yeah. And he, he's also a convert to Islam. Yeah, yeah. He converted in the U.S. Converted how, in the U.S. So when did he when did he convert? Was it? Around the same time? Well, I mean, maybe it was a year or two before me, something like this. But he had, also uh, specializing in history. And yeah, yeah. But he went to Medina. We went together to Medina. Oh, sure. We went together to Medina. So, <clears throat> so the point, though, is that when I reached that point where I could see contradictions which could not be reconciled, you can't say both are correct. Mm -hmm. I realized that I needed to go to the sources mm -hmm. to get Islam from the sources to understand it because I, I felt something was obviously wrong here you know it's not something you could talk about out loud you know we would us convert muslims that were there in front of the time we would we would grumble about these differences amongst ourselves but you don't say this to a to a born muslim because huh to billah <laughs> so we had to just in the background we would grumble and say hey, look at this they're telling us this and that shaitan has got you man it's in your head it's shaitan you know so alhamdulillah so when we went to medina then the, the enlightenment came we came to understand the origins of madhabs and these kind of things and alhamdulillah you know Subhanallah, never people, look back people leave this thing <clears> they don't know how blessed they are to especially in the english world we have so much literature you know from different people such as yourself and other people in english but at this time the nothing 70s, the only books we had were the ahmadi books because they <coughs> you have a translation of at this point Ahmadi translation Only of the Quran. The, yeah. That was what was available. You know, we then then Yusuf Ali showed up, <coughs> but difficult to get a hold of a copy. So it must have been very difficult. Yeah, so, yeah. So you kind of just figuring it out for yourself, you know. But it didn't put you off his thought. No, no. It, <coughs> I mean, Allah presented a way. Hmm. But who was the first kind of person you came into contact with who? was like, you know, not, you know, on the madhab way, you know, someone who was kind of looking at Islam uh, from an objective perspective. It's really when I came to Medina. Yeah. yeah. So in Medina, you know, then, you know, this discussion was there amongst the students. They didn't insist on any one madhab, even though they use the, uh, in the, in the high school, junior high, they use books from the um, Hanbali Madhab. But in the college, university, they, we studied from books which were uh, non-Madhab specific books. You know, So we, we looked at the classics, the classic works, <clears throat> did research studies, we attend many classes, scholars, I to sit in the circles of Sheikh Nasruddin Albani and uh, Sheikh Bin Baz, 
Sheikh uh, Abu Bakr al Jazairi and uh, Sheikh Omar al Fulata, you know, the, the well known scholars who were teaching in Medina. No, Sheikh Al Uthaymin was in uh, Riyadh side, you know, Riyadh, uh, uh, Qasim, that's where he was, he was based, it's another side. So when I came out to Riyadh, you know, then um, I was studying mostly in the uh, circles of Sheikh uh, bin Baz because he had a big class going on there. So I would attend his, as well as, yeah, others. How was it meeting these big scholars? The people were very humble, you know, very, you know, simple. You know, there was not uh, uh, the hype uh, wasn't really there. So it's, it was very, um, very like Medina, mm. you know. We, I mean, we act, had access to scholars, big scholars who came from Egypt, you know, who were teaching there, who were, you know, known as giants of, you know, scholarship in Egypt. But, you know, they're regular people. They would sit and talk with students and, you know, it was... It was it wasn't the you know superstar yeah. uh, type of <laughs> relationship you know yeah, so sure. alhamdulillah sure. so how long was you studying in Medina? well I did uh, basically five years or five and a half years you know four years of the college you know and a year year and a half of the language school and then I went on to Riyadh do my masters. I started teaching then and did my masters at the same time. Yeah, Ghanaians have mm -hmm. uh, they have a strong Islamic, <coughs> you know, mm -hmm. Arabic background. Because yeah. my teacher when I was studying in Medina, uh, his informal teacher was mm -hmm. Ghanaian. I used to study under him mm -hmm. in preparation for his name was Muhammad Rabia. Okay. He's in the States. He's mm -hmm. still in the States and, mm -hmm. and stuff. But uh, he and Abdullah Hakim, uh, Abdullah Hakim, myself, and a couple others, we used to study with him. He, we taught him English, and he would teach us Arabic. You know, building and preparing us for the university. Well. <coughs> yeah. I met an old sheikh in uh, Ghana who knows you. The very, very old sheikh, one of the first batches of the Medina students. Mm. What's his name? I forgot his name. There's a bunch of them, though. Yeah. Man. There's a bunch of them in Ghana. Because like, I went to, they have a school. There's about four of them who are my, some of them I used to teach karate in Medina. Yeah. You know, they were my students, right? This was our means of earning some little extra money, you know, to survive there. <laughs> yeah. I used to teach karate and kung fu and, you know, so judo. You know, you know yeah, yeah, I studied. You still know it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll test it later. <laughs> okay. No problem. But uh, yeah, so there was a set of students, maybe it's maybe about 40 or 50 students, mm. you know, uh, from different parts of the world. They would, mm. I trained them. You know, mm. my wife used to sew the, the, the geese that they would wear. Mm. Uh, she would sew it up. She had the sewing mm. machine. And this was our means of generating just I'm survival sure. money, man. You know, sure. surviving in Medina in those days, back in the, you know, the early... Mm. 90 is uh, not sorry, it's early. Um, that's what I said. Uh, it was 19, um, what am I talking about 70s, right? 1974, mm. you know, mm. 74. You it's can't different, imagine different what Medina Medina was like, then. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, woof. Did, so, did, 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 they didn't provide, they didn't provide no, 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 married students, you're on your own. Super you're on your own. The same money they gave to the single students is the same money they gave to you. Yeah. And you had to say, you couldn't be on campus because they were getting that money, but they were living on campus. They would send that money home, build a palace. When they graduate, yeah. they go back, you know, they're yeah. living high, you know, Still from India. Yeah, yeah. They'll fail, 
It'll pass oh. one year, fail a year, pass a year, fail. So then the, the whole four-year degree becomes an eight-year degree. You're earning all of this salary for the eight years. You know, you come back, man, you are laid out. You are the sheikh. You understand? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So all that was going on. For so us, you know, they're start struggling, you know, just survival. You know? <laughs> you know, serious survival mode, man. I remember not eating, you know, eating meat like once a week. Well, yeah. sure. <laughs> you know? so, yeah. the students are easy now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't know. They're really complaining, I of course. Met one know? Student. Huh? Uh, I was there last week. I met one student. He said, I've been here 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he started from Sanoe, right? He started from high, from uh, junior yeah. high school, from grade eight. This That's one, what they do it. No. This one started, he's been doing what? Mrs. Kipping. No, but you can only do so many times because they, they put in the thing that if you do it twice, they'll fail, they'll kick you out. They, they started to put that in. Well, I don't know how yeah. we got to No, no, that's years. what I'm saying. Those people yeah. who you hear that's kind of numbers, they've been there, they came there from the, from the grade eight. Okay. So they do grade eight, nine, <coughs> 10, 11, 12, right? Seven, actually. Seven is the beginning of, of Thanawi. Mm. So, so they got a uh, Mutawasit, sorry, Mutawasit. So they got a good six years. Mm -hmm. Those six years, they turn into 12 years. Because you, as I said, you're mm -hmm. only allowed to fail once. Mm -hmm. right? So they will pass. They'll fail, then they pass. Okay. Then they fail, then they pass. Then they fail. Oh, but so if you, you fail twice, it? boom, okay, you're out. Okay, okay. Right? Twice in a row. Because mm -hmm. before that, they would do that. You know, before mm -hmm. those days, people were doing failing twice, three times, and you know they're just there. They, this is for life. We're not yeah. going anywhere. Not <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be buried in you know, Bakia. You know, this is it. You were telling me you was getting involved in Dawa in Saudi as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, in 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 when I was studying in Medina, those six years in Medina, five six years. The Dawa would be during holidays when I went back to Canada, U.S., and the West Indies. So I would go back into those communities and focus mainly on the convert Muslims who were increasing, their numbers were increasing, reaching out to them, holding circles for them, guiding them, you know. Uh, U.S., as I said, West Indies has to go down regularly to Trinidad, Barbados, uh, Bahamas, Jamaica. So you, you was born in Jamaica. What, what age did you move to Canada? Uh, I was about nine, something like this. So you still have that connection with... Uh, yeah, my well, family was down there and everything, you know. Yeah. So the Dawa, of course, that's, well, that's the first place I went, actually. Sure. When I accepted Islam in Toronto, first thing I did was I flew down to Jamaica, yeah. you know, to... <laughs> to give the dawah to my family, my cousins and uncles and aunts, and you know, to reach out to them first and foremost. That was a duty, I recognized that. So uh, after giving dawah to my own parents in Canada before going down, then um, <clears throat> I remember when I went down to Jamaica and I was with one of my cousins, close cousins, and uh, he told me, oh, there's a, there's a mosque in downtown Kingston. I said, really? Please take me. So they took me down, you know, and they, yeah, we came up this. Nice masjid, you know. When we came up, tablik. and I'm second. No, no, it wasn't tablik. It wasn't tablik. No, I came up looking and see, I said, something strange about this place. So then when I got closer and I went up to the front door, I saw the thing, Baha'i, Temple, yes, the Baha'is, you know. So because they are a breakaway sect from Islam, from Shiite Islam, and, and uh, they they retained the Eastern style of place of worship. So it looked like a mosque, but it wasn't. So there, I I hunted in Jamaica for Muslims. I finally came across one Muslim in Montego Bay, you know, an old Indian man. He was dying of cancer at the time. He had built a little mosque on his land, 
couple of workers who worked for him, they converted to Islam. So they used to pray there. He used to give the Juma khutbah. And uh, then eventually the word reached a couple of sisters who, older sisters who had accepted Islam in New York. And they came back down to Jamaica to live out their lives there. So they came to the mosque. And so I met a little handful. That was about it. That was it of Islam in Jamaica. Now, you know, Jamaica, they have over 35 mosques, you know, many thousands of Muslims, you know. That, those days, oof. <laughs> Islam was just non-existent. I can't imagine the world like that. You know, I've kind of been raised in a world where Islam is everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, I've traveled a lot. Every country you go to, every city, there's Muslims, you know. So, um, you find them in the, in the jungles, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Muslims. Mm -hmm. SubhanAllah. Those were the days. So, Subhanallah, during your after your studies and during your studies, you you was also writing and you authored quite, well, quite a lot of books. The writing began in Riyadh. In Riyadh, I was asked to join a school, it was an Islamic school uh, called Manarat Riyadh. And um, to design the curriculum for grade one to 12. So um, <clears throat> at that time, it was like 1979, 1980, there were no books on Islam available for children, for young people to study in English. In English. Mm -hmm. So I had to create something. So at that time, that's what forced me to write. I was not a writer in you know, particular. Uh, my father was, of course, masters in English, teaching English as a foreign language and all that. My mother was also a teacher, you know, mathematics. And and they helped me to to put things together to to write they 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 reviewed my materials and helped me to to get it in the best format you know i was a writer from the perspective that i started from my communist days to keep notes a recorder you could say more than writer I recorded, and then every book that I read of Islam, I took out the most key ideas mm -hmm. and I put them in books. Mm -hmm. So if I want to review that idea, get back to it, I could just flip. I didn't have to go back through the book again. Mm -hmm. so, so I had that practice mm -hmm. of writing, but it wasn't really uh, creation. It wasn't authorship. Mm -hmm. It was just basically uh, recording material. <clears throat> so um, I had to take the ideas now, which I had studied in Medina over the four years, etc., and bring them down to the level which was appropriate for grade 12, 11, 10, 9. So this was a challenge. I said, with the help of my parents, I've prepared materials. Uh, as like notes, which we printed out and stuff like this, circulated amongst students and um, uh, developed teaching skills, which helped also for Dawa purposes, to give lectures, etc. Because I would travel regularly, as I said, to the West. Um, although in Riyadh, there were, there were foreign communities there, mostly Filipinos who didn't know Islam. And they were starting to come into Islam. There were a few brothers who were engaged in Dawah there. One brother, uh, what's his name now, Dr. Dr. Jalil, Jalil Uddin. 
Dr. Jalil-Uddin. He was a professor of English at Imam Ibn Saud University. And he, with the English, was giving dawah to uh, Filipinos. He, on rooftop of uh, apartment buildings, mm. you know, he would invite them on the weekend, the one day they were off, Friday, whatever, he'd invite them up there. And then he, he was giving them, you know, the Didat style uh, dawah. <clears throat> so I attended, you know, a few sessions and um, got, uh, got engaged in explaining as one who had converted from Christianity, you know, explaining the, 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 the lack of logic in the, in the Christian belief system, uh, you know. So this was more my f focus. I never really went into, you know, the verses and uh, trying to argue from their verses. This brother, Jalaluddin, he had read quite extensively and from Ahmed Didat's works. And uh, he was giving that side. I was giving more from the logic and having been a Christian myself, yeah. you know. And uh, so the dawah started from the rooftops. <laughs> in Riyadh, yeah, yeah, from the rooftops. And then in Batha, we eventually got a center set up there. You know, that's the first of what they call the Makatibul Jaliat, or the um, foreign communities uh, offices. That they spread all over uh, Saudi Arabia later. In every city, every part of a city, they set them up. You know, because Saudis were key to do something, and uh, but they obviously their English usually is so weak they couldn't make the dawah themselves, mm -hmm. so they would try to you know get somebody who had already converted or whatever. You know, me I was the one who was being carried around to many of the companies and that this was this was the method that they would use to um, take time off the workers' uh, shifts. Uh, car companies, farms, etc. Gather them and just give you know a one-hour presentation to them, you know about Islam. Really focusing on explaining to them what Islam is, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, <clears throat> that picked up, you know, as time went by more and more till we started. Uh, I started the first translation of the khutbah, you know. Uh, not they wouldn't do khutbah in English. Mm. It, it never really reached that point there. What it was was the the khutbah was translated either simultaneously. They would bring the non-Muslims to the back of the masjid, and somebody would translate simultaneously. And or the other way was notes would be taken by the person was going to do that, I did, I used to prepare notes from the khutbah and then afterwards I'd explain to them what was the khutbah about mm. so that it had value for them, you know. So started that practice. That started in the, in the living room of one of the imams. Mm. I was asked to come and translate for these converts after the thing. And from that it spread till we had to hold it in the master, in another section of the master and, you know, became a standard practice yeah, yeah across uh, Saudi Arabia afterwards mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Alhamdulillah. so Alhamdulillah so you after uh, studying in Medina you traveled to the UK right? no studying... no no I, I was in Riyadh the, my, when I did my PhD in the UK uh, it was done I only had to go to Lampeter uh, I went there in, in, in Wales I went there uh, maybe about three times. Mm. So it was because it was by research. Mm. So I didn't have to take any classes. Mm. It was just research for the PhD. I, I went there, defended it, you know, sat with my professors and so and so, who my advisors, supervisors. So uh, going to the UK was was going mainly in the 90s. Mm. I, I was going there 
uh, for our purposes. Because mm -hmm. I used to stop off in the UK on the way, the flight from Saudi Arabia back to Canada would always go through the UK. There were no direct flights at that mm -hmm. time. So we'd stop off in the UK. So I'd stop off there for a week, spend the time traveling around the UK, giving dawah and mm -hmm. teaching in some of the different masters, holding classes. And just, just to mention some of the books uh, that you've authored, you know, you've authored many, uh, the book on Tawheed, uh, the evolution of fiqh, you've also written about Shiaism as well. Um, SubhanAllah, how many books would you say you've authored? Do you know how many? Published books, it's, it's over 50. Yeah. Over 50 individual um, topics, Islamic topics, right? Whether it's usul al-tafsir, usul al-hadith, you know, um, in, in all the various areas. The only area I think I haven't written on uh, is sirah. So I've done tafsirs, I've, you know, published uh, books in fiqh, in uh, not only usul al-hadith, but actually compilation of hadith called the best in Islam. Um, and um, clash of civilizations. And uh, total, as I said, about 50 books uh, in, in, uh, as individual topics. I did a series which I, I edited, prepared, etc., and published a series for children uh, learning English uh, called the Iman reading series that has 56 books by itself you know and that was for teaching Islamic English English presented in an Islamic package you know which is being used in schools around the world uh, till today that was back in the 90s mm -hmm. so where did the idea come around for the Islamic online university well, you know, it, it was a gradual stage. High school teacher, doing my master's, finishing the master's, finishing the PhD while doing Dawa, uh, but still teaching. From the PhD, it, you know, I became a lecturer, a teacher in university, right? I was teacher in university for um, 10 years in, in uh, UAE the American University in Dubai. I taught there, Islamic Studies and that. I was the department. And uh, this is where the need to set up an Islamic department came. I set one up in Ajman, University in Ajman, Department of Islamic Studies there, English medium. And then from there, Islamic Studies department, the next step is university. So I, then I set up a university in Chennai. You know, after you know, after setting up a university, and I had set up that university in, in India. And it was the first accredited, that is government accredited, Islamic university in India. You know, I know people think that there should be yeah. There were universities, there are Aligarh, and they're not Islamic. Those universities are not Islamic. Mm. The, the, the most, in Aligarh, which is the most famous one, uh, the, the strongest student body, you know, they have student mm. groups, is the communist, uh, what do you call it, the communist uh, student group. Yeah. That's the strongest one in the university. That tells it all right there. Mm -hmm. If they're the strongest with the strongest following and all this kind of thing, that's telling you. Islamically, it's out to lunch. Mm -hmm. You know, Osmaniya University in Hyderabad, I went there. I went to their library and everything. The head of the university is a Hindu. Mm -hmm. You know, it's called Osmaniya <laughs> University, but there's nothing Islamic about it. So, the, so your IOU was the first Islamic online, 
university registered. Yeah, it, no, it wasn't called IOU. It was called, it is called, and it's still called, it's functioning okay. in Chennai. It, it's called Preston International College. Okay. Right? But it, it is registered as a university. It is connected with uh, Madras University. Uh, it was the first in, 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 in India. Yeah. yeah. So, alhamdulillah, you know, I was prepared to live there. I brought my families oh. over and everything, but the government had other plans. Mm. They didn't renew my visa. Oh. Once they saw where it was going, because what I was trying to do develop there was an international Islamic university. Because mm. there's none for India. There is in Islamabad, mm. there is in Dhaka in Bangladesh, there is in KL in you know yeah. and there is in Uganda there, Kampala, yeah. International Islamic University. So these exist, but none in India. Mm. You know, with two hundred million Muslims. Mm. So this was my intention. Mm. But from the very beginning, they sabotaged those intentions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, no, no. I tried to get teachers from all over, from Egypt, from Kenya. From, they wouldn't give them visas. So, I had to get my teachers from India. Mm. So I went, tried to got, get other professors who would be teaching with me from India. Then we wanted, I wanted a varied student body. So we invited students from all over the world no visas so, or they would go to the to the embassy the embassy would tell them there's no such university yeah. it's fake <laughs> even though we were registered and everything they found any excuse to just stop the people so virtually nobody could come in from the outside so it was what, what, Indian what University. Year was this? What year was this? This was 2009. SubhanAllah. 2009. Not long yeah. ago. Yeah. So um, what I did was I decided that at least, because it was in Chennai, you know, South India, Tamil Nadu, at least the student body should not just be all from Tamil Nadu. So it's just a Tamil Nadu university, like each university, mm -hmm. you know, generally. It's the people of that state who go there. So I did a tour of all the major cities, New Delhi, you know, uh, Mumbai, mm -hmm. Mangalore, Bangalore. You know, I went to all the major cities and invited students to come to study in Chennai. So at least, alhamdulillah, the student body was from all over mm -hmm. India. You know, which is very important for mm. an Islamic university that it it has the the Hajj spirit. Mm. You know, people getting to know each other, Muslims from different parts. Mm. You know, but as I said, when the time came to renew my visa after one year, no renewed visa, so I had to go back to Qatar. Mm. So at that point, I decided, okay, it's time to go online. I was already preparing. From 2007, I had started a bachelor's program mm. in Dawa, connected to Omdurman Islamic University in Khartoum, in Omdurman in mm. Sudan. They already approved the syllabus. I was using their syllabus, translated into English and so on and so on. Mm. So the preparations for going online was already there in place. Mm. So the plan was I should start in 2011, because from seven, 2007, 2011, four years, I would have finished the curriculum, ready to go online. But when I was blocked and forced to go back to Qatar, then I decided at that point, after 2009, going into 2010, to start in 2010. So I launched the university online in 2010, because to, the, uh, online, Nobody could stop me. I could hire anybody I wanted to hire from anywhere else, whatever. In every know. country. Yeah. Students from everywhere were coming. They were, mm. as soon as I started 
the number has just quadrupled every semester, four times the amount that we're, you know, so it's spread very rapidly. How many rapidly. students do you have now? Registered well, registered, who have registered, it's over half a million. Yeah. Over 500,000 students have registered, mm. you know. But uh, that doesn't give you the figure of those who are currently active mm. because students come and go, come and go. Mm. They stop for one semester or they stop mm. for two semesters, whatever. It's, it's up to them because yeah. they're free to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, alhamdulillah, uh, one of the big challenges that we're faced with, as all universities are faced with, are dropouts. In most universities, it doesn't matter. As long as people are coming in, your numbers are coming in, you're making the money, no problem. If you want to drop out after that, you paid, <laughs> no problem. But because our goal is changing the nation through education, this is a calamity for us, you know, which we have to deal with because we can only change the nation if they finish their studies, you know. Yeah. which prepares them to go back out in the society and affect the society yeah. and change it, you know? So we're, you know, devising different ways and means, you know, to reach out to these students to try to bring them back on board, yeah. you know, find out why they dropped out. And, you know, so we've expended a lot of energy over the last two years now, you know, especially this last year, we've been, you know, trying to focus more and more. I mean, you know, I'm yeah. arranging for... You know, this, uh, actually, big universities already have this in place. Mm. But the way we're taking it on is, is, is on another level, mm. you know, because it's, it's a real care, a real uh, important principle that we have to uh, reduce our numbers of dropouts beyond what the conventional universities have, yeah. you know. This is a big challenge, and um, this is customer care in the other in business. They call it customer care. Take care of your customers, so they'll come back again. Right? They become your regular customers. So, I mean, from our perspective, in fact, I think most universities the biggest amount of money is spent in advertisement, as most businesses standard. But in our case, we'll have to make that in student retention. Mm. We need to devise ways and means, get the latest, uh, you know, mm. data and information, you know, which is, are being, is being used by mm. different universities to help retain their students. We need to take that whole thing to another level because of the importance mm. that that holds with regards to fulfilling the mission of the university. Mm. So, you know, this is a huge challenge, Al along with the accreditation issues that, you know, a lot of countries don't want to deal with online universities. They think they're fake and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, degree mills, they call them all kinds of names. Mm -hmm. I mean, ours is very real. Yeah. And the students that have gone to, you know, big universities like the Malaysian universities, taken courses there and taken with us, they said, yeah. what you're doing there is... <laughs> You know, it's much more difficult for, than what's going on there. So, I mean, we're, the, you, you know. know you, you know, I've, I've visited many of your students around the world. You know, on my travels, mm -hmm. Africa, Asia, you know, and they're doing very well. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got centers up throughout different countries. And it's strong. It's a strong uh, syllabus. Net, yeah, and the network that the students are working with. And, uh, yeah, the students in general, in virtually, in all the fields, either ours is completely unique, mm -hmm. like in our psychology, teaching, mm -hmm. you know, bachelors in Islamic psychology. Mm -hmm. What other university in the world is teaching that, mm -hmm. you know? So we, we're, we've broken ground, you know, in, in areas that other universities have not even began to think about. So this is open, you know, if, if people want to study at the IOU, they can go to the website, they can sign up. Simple. And we're, we're trying to make it as simple as possible, you know, simpler and simpler so that the, the registration process doesn't become a knockout point, mm. you know, mm. because uh, it's, if it's not user friendly, yeah. you know, then people start, ah, too much trouble, leave it, you know, mm. but uh, we have, you know, the courses, of course, 
we're known as the Islamic online university. So people tend to think, oh, it's just Islamic subjects. Mm. You know, we have the Sharia. We have a master's in Sharia, which is recognized by the government of Indonesia. So you can do PhDs in Indonesia with our masters, etc. Um, and we have bachelors in Arabic. Again, this is to be expected. This is Islamic yeah. university. But the majority of our courses are not quote unquote Islamic. You know, it's education, Islamic banking and finance, uh, Islamic psychology or psychology, uh, business administration and information technology. And um, we are also launching in the coming semester, we're launching also agricultural economics. We're choosing subjects which are vital subjects to the, to the growing Muslim community. We're not focusing on robotics yeah. because who's using robotics in the, Muslim, in the third world? This is first world stuff. That's just training people to be a part of the brain drain, you know? Yeah. Because they'll, yeah, they'll swoop you up right away yeah. to U.S., U.K., Germany, you know. But then what did the Muslims benefit from your and knowledge? Teach it. Well, yeah. So we focus on yeah. those critical areas. We want to also include mass communications, journalism, mm -hmm. as well as uh, studies in public health. You know, these areas which are the critical areas mm -hmm. of uh, the third world. The third one need people properly trained mm -hmm. and then with an Islamic understanding because mm -hmm. that's what's unique about us. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, you can go and study these other subjects mm -hmm. anywhere in any other university, mm -hmm. but they're not teaching it from an Islamic perspective. Mm -hmm. That's the missing link. Mm -hmm. you know. And this is what we are doing and what all of the Muslim universities need to do. Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But we are, So we are pioneers in this. You know, to, to say that we offer everything, including business administration, including IT. People are IT? Islamic IT? Is there such a thing? Yes, there is. Mm. You know, it's IT taught from an Islamic perspective. Mm. And uh, no, no matter how people may think that this is just, this is just, uh, you know, technology and, you know, but technology has to exist in a society, that technology mm. is learned and applied in a society. It's not in outer space, mm. you know, it's functioning. So you can say, okay, hey, you don't need anything Islamic about that. It's floating around the world. No, it is applied in human society. And as long as you're dealing with human beings, mm. you know, Islam has guidelines to protect those human beings in all the different okay. ways. And to make that uh, technology uh, a benefit to the society and minimize the potential harm which comes from it. You know, Islam is going to identify areas that the, the non-Islamic instructors would not bother to get into because it's just it's technology. You know, you learn it, it's, you know. So there's no place for Islam here. This is, you know, IT. But reality is that IT has uh, maybe less than than the humanities, you know, because yeah. humanities are more dealing with human societal relations, teaching, education, these mm -hmm. areas. But you know, technology tends to be sort of a little bit more distant. But you know, still, it, you have to apply you know, it. You know, this is is really important. It just just the. Uh, you know the atmosphere of the of studying in the in an Islamic environment as well. You know most of the Muslims who are having issues with their faith is because of the secular education. You know, growing up if you've been growing up in a secular society, secular education, you know, running through school for the next fifteen years of secular education, it's going to have an effect. Sure. You know, because every subject is taught. As if Allah doesn't exist, mm -hmm. and if Islam is false, you know. So no matter what you study, and it's so important to have that Islamic uh, ethos, if you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. Yes. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. It's, uh, it's a pleasure, and uh, I've really enjoyed meeting you, speaking with you again. Alhamdulillah. I've known you for quite a few years now. We've seen each other in different parts of the world, mm -hmm. and 
MashaAllah. It's good to see you. Inshallah, we'll continue to do yeah. so. And, and I know I've told you this before, but for those who are listening, it was actually your video that helped me come to Islam. Believe it oh. or not. I, I told you before. Oh, I um, forgot. <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, I was uh, th through my experiences in Africa uh, with the world of the jinn, if you like, and that type of thing. Uh, I was explaining this to my friend in, in uh, my Libyan friend in the UK, and he showed me one of your videos explaining how the jinns, you know, get their information and how the, how it actually works basically. And uh, yeah, this this was the key video mm. that switched me on. Subhanallah. So, uh, <laughs> my pleasure. Uh, we appreciate. I can uh, add you uh, to my scale of good deeds. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, alhamdulillah, you, you know, you've been a, you know, I've benefited a lot from your work, especially your books uh, in English. Alhamdulillah. Uh, just clarifying and clearing up a lot of the doubts that many new Muslims have. And, you know, we use these books, they're still being used and, and promoted uh, when we're teaching the Dawah. And, you know, we, we use these as, as reading material, you know, for the, for the new and up and coming, up and coming. Uh, and uh, just before we finish, do you have any last words or any advice that you can give the Muslims or even the, the new Muslims on uh, how they should go forward in life? Well, you know, as a teacher, you know, the, the, the general advice that we will naturally give is that one has to be in that learning process. You know, we should never feel, I know enough. I have enough knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ had already informed us that whoever seeks knowledge, he or she has entered a path which is leading ultimately paradise. So this issue of learning, you know, we should look at it the way we look at ibadah. That we know if the worship is not done properly, you don't have wudu, or you broke your wudu whilst you're praying, or, you know, what to do. You know, you can't just do anything. There are clear guidelines. So similarly, when we are in that learning mode, and it should be a part of our lives till we leave this world, we should consider all of the factors that will make sure that the knowledge we're getting is correct, the understanding of it is correct, and the application of it it's correct, you know, because otherwise shaitan knew Allah, knows who Allah is, you know. So it's not just the knowledge by itself. So you say, I can get it from a book. You know, I can watch the video here and, you know, YouTube and I can get it from there. No. Learning in that way where you're just taking from whatever is available, you know, is the cocktail. Yeah. It's mixed up. And if you don't have uh, proper teachers, proper sources of knowledge, content, where you access content, then that knowledge will not benefit you. It may benefit you from a material perspective, because you've got a degree and now you're making money or in this position, etc., but it won't benefit you ultimately in this life and the next. Mm -hmm. So we need to recognize uh, this responsibility that the Prophet ﷺ put on us when he told us, convey whatever you've learned from me, even though it is only a single verse from the Quran to convey. He told us to convey. But he also told us to seek knowledge. 
talabul ilmi farid ala kulli muslim seeking knowledge is compulsory for every muslim so he gave us two instructions one that it is obligatory for us to get that knowledge because why because it will put us on a path to paradise and also it is obligatory for us to convey whatever of the knowledge we have gained we have benefited from we've understood etc you know so it's to both aspects being a student and being a teacher you know and anyone who is a student can be a teacher he may not be able to be university teacher lecturer professor but there is all there are always people around him who he can teach he can pass that knowledge on to so that is the responsibility that every muslim has and has to fulfill which allah will ask us about on the day of judgment so that would be my general advice that we need to look at this process as ibadah it's a blessed process being a teacher and a student student first teacher after simultaneously this is a process that each muslim should be conscious of we could ask ourselves what have i learned today who have i taught today if we're not learning anything we're not teaching anything then we are like as allah said al an'am whom kal an'am bal hum adam they the disbelievers who don't have any consciousness of god they are like animals or in fact they are more deviated because the animal is just doing what he is created for where human beings living like an animal this is you can't get worse than that and that's not what you were created for yes there's an animal aspect to your life but that's not what you were created for so this would be my advice to those who are watching this program and um inshallah i pray that allah gives all of you the insight and this islamic understanding of life and that allah accepts us on that path to paradise and gives us paradise Amen. Thank you.